By the way, before starting the non-relativistic approximation, <coughs> in the presence of a central potential, let me refer to the previous R. When I was talking about this B, a constant homogeneous magnetic field, which I, you can choose to be the direction of the third axis in your choice of frames, then you are asked to construct the A associated with this. And how do you do this? Well, it is the inversion of this equation, right? When A is given, B, finding B is easy by taking the curl of that. But when B is given, to solve this equation, which are three coupled first degree dif differential equations, may not be that trivial, but that's still a subject of electromagnetic theory, even at the freshman level, I, I should say, that if you solve this, I can immediately write several solutions for A. For example, let me list some of them. B minus y over 2, or perhaps much better is to write it as such, minus y, x, and 0. And the other one is b minus y and 0, 0. And the third solution is b, 0, x, 0, 0. Notice that, you can check that, all the three of them, when you take the curl, you get the b. Well, because that's the equation of motion. And then all, of, all the three of them satisfy the Coulomb gauge divergence of A is equal to zero. There are two conditions to be satisfied. Well, this is called the symmetric gauge. The second and third are known as the Landau gauges, and they are very suitable for the discussion of the so-called Landau level problems. When you have a charged particle in, in, in the field of such a constant and homogeneous magnetic field, then you will have quantized energy levels. All of a sudden, you, you, you may wonder where the quantized energy levels come in, because there is no space confinement. In quantum theory, one of the reasons of quantization of the energy levels are the, due to the space confinement. You confine an object in a limited space, like a box, then you get the energy quantization rules. But that problem is very interesting in its own right, the so-called Landau level problem. But enjoy yourself. Try to solve this equation for A and see that indeed you can get solutions of that for. The first solution is the one which I have used, one half B cross R, the so-called symmetric gauge. But in the, in the second and third, in the Landau gauges, of course, it's a little difficult to write it in that compact vector form, but you can use the component form, of course. You can also further enjoy yourself by finding the gauge transformations which takes you from here to here or there or vice versa, because they're all gauge equivalent, right? You, you should be able to relate them to each other through the gauge transformations, but that's not the subject of us today. Now, let me start the issue which I have mentioned already in the previous hour. So, non-relativistic reduction or limit, if you want, for the Coulomb problem case, Coulomb potential. Well, of course, the discussion is more general than the Coulomb potential. It is valid for any spherically symmetric potential case, but for our problem, it is uh, too illustrated. We have to go to a specific potential. It is the Coulomb potential, and we are going to see that those hyperfine correction terms of the hydrogen atom will all follow from this reduction. So what is the Hamiltonian? Well, I will look at the stationary state solutions. Stationary state, stationary bound state solutions to be. Yeah. 
So the equation is reduced to the e stationary state enables you to go from the full-time dependent equation to the energy eigenvalue equation. HD is the Dirac Hamiltonian for this case, which is C alpha P plus M C squared beta plus VCO4. I write it directly B of R, this. And there is nowhere else any, any sign of, any trace of the electromagnetism, only the potential part is there. So it is this problem which I will focus on to get the non-relativistic reduction. And we again start with the usual observation that the largest energy in this framework is the MC squared. And for the time dependent case to re remove it from the system was uh, by taking that famous time dependent factor which corresponds to a very fast oscillation. However, the time is for the stationary state solutions, time is not manifest. We have this time independent equation. How do I take care of that argument? Again, that large term should be subtracted. The subtraction is done by the definition of the energy in terms of a so-called E prime by subtracting this from the E. I say, let me subtract that large energy from the beginning and I focus on the E prime. You see, non-relativistic limit is really straightforward. The, all, the, the essential point is to re recognize that mc squared is the largest energy, is find a way of removing it from the system. And so that you can deal with reasonably small energies at the order of 10 electron volts. You see, that's not a big deal, really. If you just write the E equals E prime plus mc squared, and you move the mc squared to the left-hand side, and write the equation as Dirac Hamiltonian minus the mc squared times the identity psi e prime psi. e prime is eventually is the one which is going to be related to the non-relativistic energy, so we are preparing ourselves for that. Okay, then if now ht is this, and what is the HD minus MC squared? It's going to modify this term. So it, it, this one is equal to C alpha P plus MC squared beta minus the identity plus V. What is the beta minus the identity? This let me show you what is the form of this matrix. This is the beta matrix and that's the identity matrix. Obviously the left block will be killed so it's going to be 0 minus 2i. The, the i is now in the print in the in these 4 by 4 matrices are the two dimensional matrices. So what is the entire form of this HD, that particular reduced Dirac Hamiltonian? So HD minus MC squared. The identity is V, V minus 2 MC squared. C sigma dot P, C sigma dot P, this is the HT minus MC squared. Okay. So I can work out the equation by writing this psi 
as two component spinners phi and chi V V minus two M C squared C sigma P C sigma P phi chi E prime phi chi. Okay, that's the equation. Again, I can write them in the two component form, which is C sigma dot P phi plus V chi is equal to E prime phi, the one which I obtained from the upper line, because it's a four by four matrix, then I, I reduce it two by two form. The second one is, sorry, that's the first one. The second one is C sigma dot P phi plus V minus two MC squared chi is E prime chi. Okay. So here are the coupled equations involving the two component spinners. Okay. Let me focus on the second equation. Notice that it's yet exact. I haven't done an approximation. If I write this equation in the following form, sigma dot p phi is equal to, if I move everything to the right hand side, let me write it in the aesthetically appealing form. So, signs are correct, yes. E prime minus V, yeah. If I write this now as 2MC squared plus E prime minus V on chi, notice that this goes there, changing signs. And now we can factor this and write it as 2MC squared. 1 plus e prime minus v divided by 2mc squared for the obvious reason. So you can see that the both sides are relating the phi and chi to each other again in an exact form. There is no approximation because we are just re following the steps. Both, both the first and the second and in this version are equivalent and they are exact, no approximations yet. Well, the second equation enables us to relate the chi and the phi together. I can write this chi by moving this factor to the left as c's cancel. So 1 over 2mc, 1 plus e prime minus v divided by 2mc squared to the inverse because I'm taking the inverse of it and putting it to the front of it. Sigma dot P phi. Nice. Still exact. And chi and phi are related to each other. And let's check again the order of the ratio chi over phi. We remember again, we have four dimensional spinners, the upper two component and lower two component in the relativistic case. We know that in the non-relativistic case, we have only positive energy solutions and two component spinners. 
And we also know that the lower two components are related to the negative energy solutions. And they have to decouple in the non-relativistic limit. And so that they have to have a correct order related to V over C. So what is this? This is P. P is MB. M cancels. There is a C V over C. And that's order 1. Therefore, the chi over phi, even at this level, has the, has the order O V over C, right? Correctly. For the non relativistic speeds of ordinary day, ordinary life, this is zero. No. One part in 300,000 or 100,000 or something like that, or even million. That's good. So we are on the right track. The chi and phi, chi over phi ratio is correctly taken care of by this exact expression. And from this point on, we can uh, go to the non relativistic approximation by, for instance, expanding this, taking this to be a small number, E is the, because remember E is, was the full relativistic energy, but E prime is E minus mc squared. This, the large rest mass energies are removed. E prime is at the order of ordinary binding energies. And it's already divided by twice the mc squared, which is one million. So it is 10 over one million, one over 100,000. I can treat it nicely as a, as suitably as a small number, right? This ratio, remember, this is of the following form. Epsilon is a small number, one over one plus epsilon. How is it? One minus epsilon plus epsilon squared over two, etc., plus minus. So that is the approximation of uh, an uh, expression of that form, one over one plus epsilon. So what we are going to do then is, going to do non elastic approximation, we are going to use that approximate expression and retain the terms at the first order, because we are doing atomic physics and retaining term of order one over uh, v over c is enough. So what is then the chi? Chi in the non-relativistic approximation is one over two mc one minus e prime minus v over two mc squared I have retained only the leading order term times sigma dot p phi. So that is how chi is related to, related to phi, and that is the approximation. It was an exact, yet to all orders you can compute that. This is the non elastic approximation because we have retained only the first order term. Okay. What we have to do then, take that chi, leading order expression of chi in terms of phi, and substitute it in the first equation to get an equation for the phi, the upper component. So sigma dot, sigma c, c sigma dot p times chi, that expression there, and I have to replace it with that one. 1 over 2mc, 1 minus e prime minus v divided by 2mc squared. Sigma dot p phi. Correct? Yes. Plus v phi. E prime phi. That is the form of the equation. Let me 
elaborate on this a little bit. Notice that this overall C cancels against this one. Uh, leading term is 1 over 2m sigma dot p squared minus now 1 over 2m, 1 over 2m c squared, 1 over 4m squared c squared sigma dot p e prime minus v sigma dot p plus v phi is equal to e prime phi is the form of the equation. I have written it in such a form that you could see that there is a Hamiltonian which is the non-relativistic Hamiltonian acting on phi giving you the e prime times phi. It is in the typical form of an energy eigenvalue equation in relation with this two component spinner phi. Okay, let me simplify this. I will give it a name yet so that notation should be consistent with the one I have used. Non-relativistic, I call it. Okay. What is this? Sigma dot p squared is sigma i sigma j p i p j. Sigma i sigma j is delta i j plus i epsilon i j k sigma k. Epsilon i j k sigma k times p i p j. One is anti-symmetric, the other is symmetric. So p i p j term must give nothing. And so this is the first term is 1 over 2 m p squared. That is, perhaps in order to, <laughs> it was too fast in plain English, so this term is what? Sigma i, sigma j times p i, p j. You decompose this into the usual delta i j and epsilon i j k, sigma k terms. That second term, sigma i, epsilon i j k is anti-symmetric, this is symmetric. Because p i, p j commutes, remember? These are the canonical momenta. That's why it doesn't give any contribution. It gives just the p squared. Plus v, nice. So we see things are unfolding in a sense. The usual Coulomb Hamiltonian made its appearance plus an additional term. What is that additional term? This is minus 1 over 4 m squared c squared sigma dot p e prime minus v sigma dot p. That's the additional piece. This is the Coulomb piece, right? So this additional term is the one which should lead to all those corrections coming from the relativity. This, let me call this a name, delta H. It should contain eventually the kinetic energy correction term plus the spin orbit correction term plus the Darwin. So uh, it looks a bit strange and ugly, but it's going to lead to all those beautiful corrections and you're going to like this. So with this HNR, the equation then has the form. We haven't worried about one thing in the previous example. In principle, we should have. Now perhaps you can go back and check it on your own, make a note of it. Now let's check this one in here. It looks an energy eigenvalue equation or time independent Schrodinger equation. And it's the, if it is the correct quantum mechanical equation to, to describe the 
ordinary non-relativistic two-component spinner, then you need to have a normalized spinner, right? Scalar functions are normalized, and spinners are whether they are two-dimensional or four-dimensional, doesn't matter. They need to be normalized, otherwise you cannot attribute a quantum mechanical meaning to it. So we have to check the normalization of phi. Are they normalized? Well, one thing we are sure of is that the starting point was normalized. That is, psi dagger psi, that four component spinner was normalized. In the two component language, this is d cube x phi dagger phi plus chi dagger chi, right? Because we have written it phi and chi as the upper and lower two component spinners. Well, we also know that chi is written in terms of the phi as given as such. Chi is proportional to phi. So let's take into account that expression. It is a, a, not a trivial matter, so we have to really carefully count the orders. How are we going to do that? Let me go back to that expression, chi and phi relationship. Let me copy it. It's, it is a, a nice expression that we should take care of. So, chi 1 over 2 mc sigma dot p is the first term, plus second term is minus, actually. So, minus 1 over 4 m squared c cube the dimensions are correct, times e prime minus v sigma dot p phi. So this is how chi is related to phi. Let me start counting the orders. What is the order of this? p is mb, m cancel v over c. So this is order beta. What about the order in here? First of all, there is P over MC, which is a beta. What is left over is energy divided by MC squared, right from here. M, because part of the M and C is gone, there is M and C squared left. Energy, E prime minus V at the atomic level, what are the orders of energies? Alpha squared, mc squared, right? So this is alpha squared, mc squared, orders, divided by mc squared. So this is order alpha squared. Wow, this is complicated, right? The first one is naive and simple beta order, but in the second, we have alpha squared times beta. However, we are in game because beta is at the order of alpha, right? Remember? In the atomic physics, we have seen that beta, which is V over C, comes out to be alpha. And these two constants, relativity-ness and quantum-ness, are proportional. They are the same. So this is alpha squared and beta. So I can Think of them either order beta cube, if I am focusing from the relativistic perspective, or alpha cube altogether, single constant. So let's keep track of the betas now. The first term is order beta, second term is order beta cube. Nice. 
This is chi. And I have chi times chi, chi dagger chi. So what are the kind of terms I will get from chi dagger chi? The beta and beta, which is going to be beta squared. Beta and beta cube cross beta to the 4. And beta cube and beta cube, beta to the 6. How nice. So this is the way the chi dagger chi goes. A beta squared term, beta to the 4 term, beta to the 6 term. If chi is expanded to order beta and to be retained at the beta order, then obviously the chi dagger chi should be retained at the beta squared. It means that when I'm computing the normalization, it is sufficient and correct because these approximations, expansions, are, have a well-defined systematics. I'm not pulling out of the head. I have to retain only this one for the normalization purposes. So, one, now this is in the non-relativistic limit. I'm checking the normalization. D cube x, phi dagger phi, and chi dagger chi, let me write it, and let me retain the first order terms only. If it is this term which I'm going to retain for the normalization purposes, this is 1 over 4 m squared c squared, because it is the coefficient is 1 over 2 m c, the square is 1 over 4 m squared c squared, phi dagger sigma dot p, sigma dot p, phi. That is what I have done. If chi is this times phi, the chi dagger is take the Hermitian conjugation. Phi dagger, this is Hermitian, it goes to the right. This is sigma dot p squared, which is p squared, for the reason that I have already explained. Sigma i sigma j contains a symmetric and anti-symmetric part, therefore, Antisymmetric part doesn't contribute. Fine. So what do I have then in here? I have for this expression I have phi dagger one plus p squared divided by four m squared c squared phi. <coughs> Okay, so I define this, I gave it a name, capital omega squared, just a notation, huh? nothing but more than a notation. So, obviously phi is not normalized, because this expression is telling you that one d cube x phi dagger omega squared phi is one but omega squared is a non-trivial expression so what do I do I do the following let me define define omega phi as c omega is Hermitian because p is Hermitian so, phi dagger omega is xi dagger. As omega is Hermitian, I, it didn't pick any dagger on it. Then, this new xi is normalized, right? Because you split omega squared as omega and omega. Omega phi you call the xi. Phi dagger omega you call xi dagger, so you have one d cube x c dagger xi. So xi is normalized. Nice. So what I have to do now is com compute xi in terms of the phi. Here is the definition. So what is xi? Xi is omega phi, which is one plus p squared divided by 
4 m squared c squared to the 1 half phi. So it is the meaning of the c in terms of the phi. Okay. So as c is normalized, what I have to do is I have to determine phi in terms of the c and substitute in the equation up there. Phi's are not good quantum mechanical spinners. The good quantum mechanical spinners are those C's which are normalized. So phi is numerous C, which is 1 plus P squared divided by 4 M squared C squared to the minus a half C. So I have to solve phi in terms of this and substitute in, in, into, into the equation. Okay. So how do I do that? Here is the equation. H and R phi E prime phi omega inverse C omega inverse C. I have to write it in both sides. H and R omega inverse on C is equal to E prime omega inverse on C. So Cs are good, good spinners. We have to proceed with this new form of the equation. How do I now go about this? What I will do next is I invite you to think about it on your own. Well, some of you already know that there's a subtle trick in here. Normally, normally what you tend to, what comes to your mind first is to multiply this equation now from left by the omega, capital omega, so it is omega h omega inverse, sort of a similarity transformation. And in the right hand side, as this is a number constant, that omega will cancel this, and you'll have a cleaner, simple equation to start with. That's not it. I always invite challenges to go through that second method and to get the same equation. Because, well, one thing is clear in physics. There's one physical correct, one physical fact. And whichever method you use, you should be able to reach to the same conclusion. If your result depends on the method or approach you are using, something must be wrong with that. So that's the reason why I'm saying that. Use alternative methods and check whether you can get the same result through those simpler reasonings. But I will follow my own way. I will multiply this with the omega inverse, both sides. Notice that I multiplied from the left by omega inverse. So right hand side becomes E prime omega minus 2. C. Omega is that. Omega squared is that. And omega minus 2 is its inverse, right? Okay. Okay, so omega inverse minus 2 is 1 divided by 1 p squared divided by 4 m squared c squared. Notice that this is v over c squared, v squared over c squared, that is. So what is the two leading order expression for this? P is MC, there is 
m squared c squared down there, m squared goes away, that's beta squared order, so it is, for that order, that's the expression. So what is the right hand side then of that equation? Right hand side is e prime omega to the minus 2 times c, right? c is the normalized spinner now. So if I go to this order, relevant order, which is e prime 1 minus p squared divided by 4 m squared c squared, relevant order. So we have to always, to be on the safe side, indicate that it's approximation, not exact, because it is valid to the leading order. So that's the right hand side. So if I leave this as the leading term, what is the additional piece? e prime p squared divided by 4 m squared c squared times c. So what I will do next is move this to the left hand side and write, it, write the equation in the following form. Omega inverse h non-relativistic omega inverse plus this additional piece e prime p squared divided by 4 m squared c squared c of course to this or to this order e prime c now i have a nice looking equation c's are the normalized two component spinners and here as the hamiltonian i have this rather cumbersome looking complicated expression which I have to start elaborating. I will give this a name. If you want, I will call it non-relativistic C. That is, it is not the original non-relativistic Hamiltonian that I have found taking the limit. It is the new transformed one so that I have the C equation as the correct equation. So I have to start playing with this. Okay, so that's the expression which I have to deal with a little bit. So what is it? H non-relativistic C. Again, I'm, well, if you want to the desired order, it is omega inverse from the left. This is the one over the omega squared. Omega inverse is the square root of this. So let me compute this omega inverse. One plus P squared divided by four m squared c squared to the minus a half, right? This is omega minus to the second power, this is that. If it is omega just minus to the minus one, I have to take the square root of this, which is that. What is it equal to, to the leading order? One, mi one minus p squared divided by eight m squared c squared minus, because this is minus a half, one half and four eight. So these coefficients are so vitally important. Remember, in the normal quantum mechanics, when we missed that beautiful factor of one half when we were doing spin orbit, it was a disaster, right? So we don't have to, in order to not to make such mistakes, we have to be careful. So, putting this, taking this into account, what is H and R? C to the leading order. So 1 minus p squared over 8 m squared c squared times the original number, it's the Hamiltonian, this one, plus times again the same factor from the right, p squared divided by 8 m squared c squared plus e prime p squared divided by 4 m squared c squared. Horrendous. It's really getting rather complicated. So let me 
to write this in the following order. So HNR is the leading order term which we had obtained. And there is this 1 over 8 m squared c squared HNR p squared anti-commutator term. Plus there is the 1 over well, that is the, is the, right, right, p squared divided by 8, m squared, c squared, h, n, r, p squared, 8, m squared, c squared, plus e prime, p squared divided by 4, m squared, c squared. So that's really, as you see, quite complicated. It's a good point to give another break before continuing.